Derek from Tomcat Gas Training and welcome to this video all about well basically it's about how global warming is going to affect us gas engineers in the future now this video I've decided to do has come about from the comments I've been getting from my video which is the best boiler for 2020 and it seems there is quite a bit of ignorance around there from the general public and probably gas engineers on how global warming is affecting our industry being a gas engineer. Now hopefully in this video it will put some of these comments to bed and it will show everybody exactly how global warming is affecting us, how global warming is going to affect us gas engineers and what this 2050 carbon zero neutral rubbish is going to be. So I think I've waffled enough now so let's get on with it. So the first thing is there's been a few comments on that gas boilers are not going to exist uh, by 2025 and all gas engineers are going to be out of a job. Well I want to start right off the bat by saying that's not going to happen. Certainly not in my lifetime. Now you're kind of getting confused with new builds and what we've already got out there. So um, hopefully this is going to explain all that. Now I'd just like to say right off the bat that I am a big advocate for energy efficiency and stopping global warming and keeping the planet going forever. I, um, I agree that we need to get rid of um, our get our carbon footprint down and I believe we need to try and do this to the best of our ability and as fast as we can because if we don't the information you're going to see in this video is quite frightening for us all so yes I am a gas engineer yes I train gas engineers but when you see some of the figures well are in this video you'll find getting rid of gas boilers is not going to happen to at least 2050 okay and we are bringing in measures as we speak to continue this after 2050 okay first thing I want to look at is what is global warming and what's it all about now there's loads of theories out there about global warming and why it's happened and some guys say it's a natural phenomenon what happens with the earth we go up in temperature we go down in temperature but since the industrial revolution we seem to be on a up 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 up, up with our co2 within the atmosphere now we need co2 in our atmosphere if we didn't have any CO2 in our atmosphere, then we would be a frozen planet because the CO2 helps keep the heat from the sun. So what happens is the sun, its solar energy, which is radiated down to us, um, comes and warms the earth. But what happens is some of that heat gets deflected back into space. Now, if it all got deflected back into space, we'd all be in the Arctic, we'd all be freezing. But it doesn't. In our atmosphere, the CO2 keeps it in. But what's happened is these greenhouse gases, which is not just CO2, we've also got... Um... So what I'm trying to say is carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, fluoridated gases such as chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons, whatever they are, and there's a few other elements in there as well, causing this uh, global warming, but I'm only interested in the CO2 because I'm a gas engineer. Uh, so it, where was I? <laughs> so the heat can go out into space. Like I say, if it did all go out there, we'd be freezing. But this CO2 keeps the heat in and bounces it back. But what they're saying now is we're at CO2 saturation. So what it's doing is, it's warming the planet up and they reckon it's warming us up by one and a half degrees and if we go over four degrees then we've got serious consequences we'll look at that later 
they're saying if we get rid of or reduce our carbon emissions, we get rid of our CO2, it will balance the planet back out and the excess heat will be able to escape out into space and we will start to cool down again. That's basically how I see global warming and how, when I've researched this, what everybody seems to be saying. Now there's loads of people out there who are just saying I'm talking nonsense. And I could be, because I ain't no scientist. I'm a gas engineer. So that's how we are told as gas engineers why we need to reduce our CO2 levels from our gas appliances so we can stop global warming. So what are the effects of this greenhouse gases and the global warming on the UK? Now, the effects of this uh, greenhouse effect and the global warming on the UK, what they say is going to happen is our winters are going to get wetter and our summers are going to get drier. Is that a bad thing? They also say this will increase flooding because of the average rainfall will increase massively. This in turn then is going to put a lot of pressure on the production of drinking water. Uh, where I live in the northwest of England, we don't seem to have any problems with drinking water, but down in the south, um, they seem to have a lot of problems with droughts and stuff like that. So this will then put a lot of strain on our uh, production of water. So that could make water costs going up, and it could also mean a shortage of water for all of us. So they say the winters will be between one and four and a half degrees warmer and up to 30% wetter. My word, do we need that? And they say the summer will be one to six degrees warmer and a massive 60% drier. <laughs> In the northwest we could do with that a little bit, couldn't we? So that is how global warming is going to affect us here in the UK. And there's going to be different effects for every country around the world. But the one thing that is going to affect everybody on this planet is the sea level is going to rise dramatically. Now a recent study has just been undertaken and what they have been looking at is what the changes to the planet would be if we did get this one to four and a half degrees warmer of the planet. And what basically came of this is we're more likely to be more like two degrees and above, which is really, really not what we want in this planet. It could actually turn us into a desert and turn us into a very, very uninhabitable planet. So the average global temperatures have risen by one degree on average since about 1850s, since the Industrial Revolution started, and 2015, 16, 17 and 18 were the hottest years ever recorded for this planet. Now our oceans absorb about 90% of the CO2 made. Now, if we continue to create more and more CO2, it's going to get to a point where the sea is not going to be able to do what it's supposed to be doing. So the sea is going to end up warming up. So if you warm water up, what does it do? It expands. So if the water starts to expand, that means the sea level is then going to rise. We've also got this extra water coming into the sea from our ice caps melting. So we're also getting all this permafrost and snow and ice all being melted and all ending up into our seas, creating again to make the sea levels rise. So between 1602 and 2015, the average the sea has risen, wait for it, is a massive 16 centimetres. 16 centimetres, how big is that? Oh, I think that's six inches. So anyway, 16 centimetres. It's quite a big, a big and large amount. So you can see why we're ending up now with things like coastal erosion because of the sea level coming up and the waves getting bigger and storms being more and the more rainfall. So you can start to see now getting our CO2 levels down 
is a must and we need to do this as fast as we can. So the Arctic is melting really, really fast. The ice is actually 65% thinner now than what it was in 1975. And if we don't get this CO2 down very, very quickly, then we are going to see ice-free summers in the Arctic by the middle of this century. And the polar bears are not going to be happy with that one, are they? A little bit of a fun fact for you. Why do we call it the Arctic and the Antarctic? Well, Arctic is supposed to have derived from the Greek word meaning bear. So in the Arctic, polar bears live. In the Antarctic, polar bears don't live. So, Arctic means polar bears, Antarctic means no polar bears. I hope that's true, because I think my dad told me that when I was a kid. And I've believed that all my life. Maybe I should research it and see if it actually is right, but it sounds correct to me and it's the way I've always remembered where the polar bears live. So, as a gas engineer, how are we going to help the planet and how are we going to get our CO2 levels down so we can continue to survive? Now, heating UK domestic properties and industry accounts for about half of the energy used in this country. It also contributes to one third of the carbon emissions. Now about 85% of the house stock in the UK is supplied with natural gas and is heated by natural gas. To give you a figure that is about 22 million homes in the UK use gas. Now, you might have heard about this net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And basically what they've done is they've taken a baseline of 1990, the carbon emissions we had then, we need to get back to those emissions by uh, 2050. So that's basically what this net zero carbon emissions mean. It doesn't mean we're having no carbon emissions whatsoever. But what it does mean is they're trying to get rid of natural gas and stop using natural gas by 2050. Will this happen? Uh, possibly it could, but I very much doubt it at the moment. Now, this is where everybody's getting confused and everybody thinking that UK homes now need to be heated by electric to get us carbon neutral. It just won't happen using electric. If you've ever had any dealings with electric heating, which most of you have, then you'll find it's not that good. And what I mean is, how many of you out there have got electric showers? How many out there have got a shower running off your boiler or your cylinder in your main bathroom and you get loads of water and then you go to your electric shower in your ensuite and it trickles out because electric is not very good at heating water when it's moving quickly. Now some of you will say oh we've got ground source, we've got air source, we've got solar PV, we've got all the, we've got wind farms, we've got hydroelectric, we've got all these different ways of uh, making electricity but it's not that good now if you take ground source and air source they're amazing they are fantastic ways of getting down our carbon emissions amazing and we should all look at getting these kind of things but in the northwestern Scotland in the middle of winter they don't work well they don't work enough to keep us really warm Okay, so we need to use some other kind of boiler backup to get us to the right temperature. So another way of us not using this electric is gas in peak demand is seven times more than electricity. So if you add that onto our electrical grid now, along with everybody having electric vehicles, 
how is our national grid for electric going to be able to cope with this situation? It's not going to happen. Now, how do we make our electricity in the UK? I've got some figures for you. So, our electricity is generated in a number of different ways. Most of the UK electricity is produced by burning fossil fuels. Hmm. Well, that's messed it up then, hasn't it? And it's mainly natural gas we use, but we also use coal as well. Now, these figures are taken from 2016 because they were the only ones I could really find on the internet which gave me the figures. So in 2016, 42% of our electricity was made by using gas. 9% in 2016 was made by coal. And about 3.1% was made by other fossil fuels. But the volume of electricity in the UK made by gas and coal changes every year and it also changes every season. Now, I do believe, I don't know how true it is, but I do believe last year was the first year where electricity was generated by other means other than gas and electric. Did I say that right? <laughs> so basically, the percentage of electric made by using gas and coal actually dropped. Other means of making electricity overtook it. I think that makes sense. So 21% of our electricity comes from nuclear, but that's going to drop because we're getting rid of the nuclear power stations. And the nuclear power stations are expected to be gone by 2035, I believe. Now, renewable technologies. Now, renewable technologies use natural energy to make electricity. Fuel sources include wind, wave, marine, hydro, biomass and solar. It makes up about 24.5% of our electricity generated in 2016. This will rise in the UK and it aims to meet the UK targets generated by 30% of its electricity by renewables by the end of this year which is pretty close. So I'd like to see whether those figures were made next year. So, as you can see from those figures, over 50% of our electric made in the UK is made using fossil fuels. But you didn't see that one coming, did you? So all you people who are saying we're gonna go everything's over to electric, it can't happen. At the moment, it can't happen because we just haven't got the infrastructure to be able to do it. And it's, the technology needs to get better as well. So how are gas engineers going to help reduce our CO2 levels? Well, hopefully we're gonna switch over to hydrogen. So uh, how, what's happening with hydrogen and why hydrogen? Well, basically, what they're doing is they're doing trials at the moment where they're mixing hydrogen with natural gas. Now, they're doing a 20-80 blend, so 20% hydrogen, 80% natural gas. And with those mixes, they're finding there's no difference with the flame picture of the gas, there's no difference with the calorific value, and there's no need to change any of the gas appliances. That's at 20%. When you start go to go over 20%, you start to see a difference. Now, one of the big differences, which I was surprised with, when you burn hydrogen, it's a clear flame. So pure hydrogen, when you burn it, you can't see it. <laughs> so if we were using it for cooking, hmm, be a few people getting burned. So using this hydrogen is hopefully going to reduce our CO2 emissions. So using this hydrogen, so they say, is going to reduce our CO2 emissions by about 6 million tonnes. So what's that equate to? Well, it equates to about 2.5 million vehicles being removed from the road. 
and that's a massive amount. So switching over from natural gas to hydrogen just by 20% has massively reduced, um, could massively reduce our CO2 emissions. So let's find out what this hydrogen is then. So hydrogen is an element. It exists naturally as a molecule. Each hydrogen molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms. In hydrogen cars, hydrogen reacts with oxygen in a fuel cell, making electricity to run the car. So the only waste product hydrogen actually produces is water vapour. So if we switch fully to hydrogen instead of natural gas, we will get the same byproducts, water vapour, instead of CO2. So because hydrogen has no carbon in it whatsoever, when you burn it, it cannot produce carbon dioxide, or even worse, <laughs> or even better, it cannot produce carbon monoxide. So it actually makes it a safer gas, if you could see it. So hydrogen is a chemical element. It has the symbol H and the atomic number of 1. So it's the first on the atomic scale. It has a standard atomic weight of 1.008, meaning it is the lightest element in the periodic table. So like with natural gas, if we have a leak of hydrogen, then it's going to be lighter than air, and that means it's going to be dispersed easier. Hydrogen is the most common chemical element in the universe, making up 75% of the normal matter within the planet. We're even made of hydrogen, or I should say, we're carbon-based with hydrogen. Now, there are actually four different types of hydrogen. There's brown hydrogen, there's grey hydrogen, there's blue hydrogen, and there's green hydrogen. So let's find out what the difference is between them all and which one of these is actually the best one. So there are four different types of hydrogen. There is brown, grey, blue and green. So let's have a look at brown first. So brown hydrogen is made from coal. This is what the Victorians used and they called it town gas before natural gas took over in the late 60s, early 70s. It was a very high carbon footprint and is not too common anymore and won't be used to replace natural gas at all. Next we've got grey hydrogen and this is made from methane or natural gas and they use steam to separate the hydrogen from the carbon. So one molecule of CH4 or natural gas reacts with H2O or water to form four H2O and one CO2 plus whatever CO2 is made generating the thousand degrees steam. This is how 98% of hydrogen is being made right now. This is still not very good for our planet. Then we've got blue hydrogen. So blue hydrogen is what the oil and gas companies will be trying to sell us on. Where they will be taking CO2 from the grey hydrogen process and store it somewhere or use it in synthetic fuels or other products. So again, not very good for the planet. And finally we've got the green hydrogen. And this is what we call the holy grail where it is made by electrolysis using renewable electricity and it's got to be renewable electricity to make it green. So solar and wind power doesn't always happen when we need it most. So using this surplus renewables to make green hydrogen does make some sense. So we could be using this green hydrogen to power our trains, cars and aeroplanes as well as our gas boilers. So they plan to make the hydrogen all year round, storing the unused hydrogen made in the summer in salt caverns underground, and then using the stored hydrogen in the winter when more is required. So you can see green hydrogen could actually be the future for us gas engineers. Now there are about 120,000 gas engineers out there, and if we go to fully hydrogen, then we're going to need more gas engineers because there won't be enough of us 
to be able to convert 85% of the house stock into hydrogen boilers. So let's hope this blend gets increased steadily as we go through the years to help everybody so when we come to changing the boilers it's a quick and easy progression and we're not all trying to rush like they did or like my dad did in the 60s and 70s when we went from coal gas to natural gas. Now the pipework distribution system which carries natural gas at the moment can also be used to transport um, hydrogen to our houses. The only difference is we can only really use plastic for a distribution pipe for hydrogen because if they use steel it makes it incredibly brittle after a long period of time when you're putting pure hydrogen through it. So if we were to go to pure hydrogen then all the pipe work will have to be changed from steel to plastic which they've been doing for years anyway. So if we do go to these 100% hydrogen boilers they are going to need to be changed but all the internal workings will pretty much stay the same obviously the gas valves are going to have to change the burners are going to have to change and also the safety devices in the condensing boilers are going to have to change flame rectification won't work with hydrogen because there's no carbon in it so we might have to go back to pilot lights <laughs> Well, they might have to come back with some kind of magnetic heat um, valve which is going to shut off when the flame shuts off. So that's going to be the major differences, but the massive differences to the planet is what we're after. So, if we sum up on what I've gone through with this video, if whether you believe me or whether you don't believe me, the CO2 levels since the Industrial Revolution have gone shooting through the roof. So why is it? Well basically it's because of the number of people on this planet. When you think about it, since the Industrial Revolution, how the population of this planet has massively increased. and. We all want the finer things in life. We all want these things. Game consoles. We all want tablets. We all want smartphones. We all want smartwatches. They all need power. They all need energy to work. When I was a kid in the 1970s, all I wanted was one of these. That's all I wanted. Go out, play football. That was it didn't care about anything else, didn't care about TV, didn't care about games well we didn't have them really, 1970s we were lucky to have a colour TV never mind a smart TV now everybody wants a smart TV in our house we've only got two bedrooms and downstairs we've got four tellies why? why do we need all these TVs? we don't why can't we all just watch one TV? Why does TV have to be 24 hours a day? Why doesn't it go off at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock like it used to? So we've all got to go to bed. So, what I'm trying to get at guys is, we can't rely on politicians to save the planet. We can only rely on ourselves. If we all make the sacrifices, if we all make the little changes, then hopefully we will stop this global warming. Are we going to do that? No, because we're incredibly selfish as a race, aren't we? We all want the best. We want the best cars. You know, we don't holiday in the UK now, we want to fly to foreign countries. Don't get me wrong, I want to do exactly the same thing, but we need to start moderating what we do. This pandemic, I would love to see what the figures are going to come out for for 2020, 
because we had three months of nobody going anywhere. We've not been able to go on holiday. We've not been able to go flying abroad. So I would really love to see if it's made any difference whatsoever. As you've seen from this video, <laughs> electricity is not the future the way we make it. We need to make renewable electricity. We, as gas engineers, we need to start educating our customers. There should be no boiler in the UK or in the world now that isn't a condensing boiler. We should have no open fluid boilers. We should have no non-condensing boilers working in homes in the UK. If you've got one, you should be looking at getting it changed. Don't listen to the nonsense about new boilers are rubbish. New boilers break down all the time. My old boiler did this. Your old boiler is killing the planet. I think, my personal view, every boiler should have heat recovery. We should be putting our flu temperatures out as cold as we can. A condensing boiler will put its flue products out at about 50 degrees and slightly less when it first starts up. Non-condensing boilers are in 150, 160, 170 degrees so that's contributing to global warming. Why do you think um, homeless people live in the towns and the cities and they don't live in the villages because villages are freezing. Towns and cities are warm because of all the wasted heat we have from industry and homes. <laughs> Sorry about the rant, but we need to start thinking about this. We need to stop blaming everybody else and we need to start looking at ourselves and we need to start thinking about saving energy. If you don't agree with anything about this, if you don't agree with global warming, if you think I'm talking absolute nonsense, then that's your right to do that. But think about this. Don't think about it as saving the planet then. Think about it as saving your money. Because the more energy efficient you get, the more money you're going to save. So if money motivates you, think about that. Think about getting energy saving light bulbs. Think about having a thermostat on your heating. There should be no heating systems in the UK or the world without a room thermostat. There shouldn't be any. <laughs> because why? we don't need to heat our homes to 30 degrees. We don't, especially in the UK. We're not used to it anyway. 19, 20 perfect temperature for sat there watching your smart TV and playing on your console and flicking through your tablet and your phone and looking at your watch while you're doing all this. So, my name is Derek Robbins and I train gas engineers. And you could say I'm a hypocrite because of the job I do and what I've done all my life. But it's up to people like me to educate our future engineers that putting a boiler in doesn't take half an hour. Putting the right controls on the system is the right thing to do educating our customers on how to use their energy efficient boilers correctly is what we should be doing. Not seeing how quick we can put the system in, putting boilers on dirty systems, trying to make as much money as we can. We all want to make money, we've all got to live, we all want to give our families the best. But if we don't do anything about these CO2 figures, we won't have a planet to live on. So, if you've liked this video, why don't you give us a thumbs up, or leave a constructive comment down below. If you've not subscribed to my channel, then please subscribe, because it helps. 
And don't forget to hit that notification bell because I release videos mainly on Mondays and Wednesdays. All I've got left to say is, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and I hope you've taken a tiny little bit of information from this video. Cheers guys.